Hello YouTube, today we're going to be talking about how there are losses in the stock market not seen since the Great Depression. Yes, you heard that right. The worst declines we have not seen in almost a hundred years. So if you're feeling pain this week, stay tuned and in this video we're going to try to do our best to understand what's happening in the market because if we understand what's happening we are much more likely to be prepared for what could come next. So, um, where do we get these stats from in terms of the war since the Great Depression? In a prevalence of selling, this, mar this is a market route without equal. Sweeping losses hit the S&P 500 at a frequency not seen before, ever. Um, even though, even in the long and storied history of the stock market meltdown, the breadth of losses is without, is without equal, based on data that goes back to the Great Depression. In five of the seven sessions through Thursday, at least nine in ten S&P 500 stocks dropped. A record run of widespread losses, according to Sundial Capital Research. To put it another way, hedge fund selling was seen more furious than in the last two days. There's never been more furious selling. They've been aggressively doing it, according to Goldman Sachs. And the reason why this is interesting is because the same firm, Goldman Sachs, also saw buy bad desks was flooded with orders during the route. So this means that there were share buybacks from corporate demand, and uh, this served as one of the most reliable sources of support. We still ended up getting record declines anyway. And we can note that here by, again, we've had 10 out of 11 red weeks. We have our worst weekly decline of 2022. We have our first weekly close in bear market this year as well. We can also note that we're starting to lose these 2018 and 2020 highs. I'm also going to talk about how we are right around the 200 weekly moving average, which is going to be where we find the Fed put. Going to talk about that in a moment. And then we also have to talk about annual volume. So there's a lot to go through this weekend. Please bear with me as I go through and try to explain what's happening in the market in terms of a couple of news articles. And then we're going to come back and have a look at the charts to understand where we could go from here. But the most important thing I just want to point out is that if we are seeing record declines we've not seen since the Great Depression, we have to take note. We have to be aware of it. And if we understand what is happening, we're more likely to be prepared for the next move. So again, if you're, watch if you're watching the video and enjoying it at any time, I would really appreciate a thumbs up. And if you could drop me a comment and subscribe to the channel, I would really, really appreciate it. All right, so it seems like Goldman Sachs is on both sides of the trade. And what is new, right? Because uh, they love making money. So they're out there uh, um, shorting it. Uh, they've also lowered their, their target here. So again, I want to point out one more thing here. Um, look at the date here. So we talked about this earlier in the week. Hedge fund selling was never more furious in the, in the last two days. This is on June 14th. And then we look at the article here from when? June 12th. Goldman sees S&P tumbling to 3150 when the recession hits. It seems like they're selling their own playbook and they're playing both sides because, again, two days later, we started seeing the most furious or aggressive short selling ever from hedge funds. And what are they doing? They're trying to find buyers. So, uh, right, they are pushing off all of the selling onto corporate America. Again, companies like Google, Amazon, Tesla, sorry, not Tesla, um, Google, Amazon, Apple, all those stocks have announced share buybacks. So who's executing those trades? The Goldman Sachs desk, right? Goldman Sachs' is unit that executes share buybacks for clients. Volume spiked to 2.8 times last year's daily average, or, uh, right, it is the firm's busiest day so far this year. Incredible. We also have very high fear. We note that we're almost back down into single digits and we've already been there. A month ago, we were at nine. And even though, even though the market's lower, we're only at about 14 right now. So uh, the market is definitely in extreme fear right now. We can also note that by looking here at Fortune Magazine and they're telling us that investors right now are uber bearish, right? B of A says. So let's just read what they tell, here, tell us here really fast. Um, right here, they're telling us that it's a bear stampede on Wall Street. Right, uh, they're uber bearish. The uh, investment bank's bull bear indicator, which gives a gauge of sentiment among traders, fell to 0, 0.0 on Thursday. Whoa! Um, the indicator previously ticked down to zero in previous moments of extreme economic anxiety. It previous it previously fell to its low level in uh, August of 2002, the dot com bubble bursting. July 2008, the Great Recession, September 2011, the European debt crisis, and September 15, when China's economy faltered, and in 2020, when we all know what happened. However, they noted that when the indicator has previously hit zero, unless there was a double-dip recession, like in 2002, or a systemic event, like 2008 and 2011, three-month returns were strong. So again, we have to look a little bit further out here to about three months, and we have to keep this 2002 
uh, 2000 to 2002, and 2008 to 2011 in mind, because they're telling us that the fear and greed is actually approaching an area where we we are actually at the end of the cycle. Again, August 2002 is when the bubble bursted. Um, July 2008 is when the Great Recession was over. So we have to ask ourselves, are we seeing any evidence that tells us yes or no? Um, we also have to look at their falling in, see, in sync. So major financial financial assets post unanimous weekly losses for two weeks in a row. After that one week up, they're right back all the way back down to red. So again, now we looked at this article. Let's read one more thing from here because I think it's important for us to understand. All right. I'm scrolling all the way down to the bottom here. So as tempting as it is to call a bottom, history suggests bear markets usually take time to find a floor, especially when they are accompanied by a recession. That's the key word there. We have to ask ourselves whether or not we're going to be facing a recession. After Jerome Powell spoke this week, uh, we better be paying close attention because um, this man is going to be speaking again this week. I'm going to jump forward to you um, to show us here that Jerome Powell is speaking on Wednesday and Thursday, giving testimony. And it means that he's going to be getting grilled for hours and hours and hours over multiple days. So if the bear market of 2022 is starting to accelerate, we're likely going to hear that from Jerome on Wednesday if he does not waver from what he said this week. What seems like a uh, right a cathartic uh, sell-off in June of 2008, a loss almost identical to April's of this year, was followed close behind by three months that were appreciably worse and two more almost equal size. Again, they're talking about three months. So the B of A survey told us that three months out, results started getting better. However, now we're noting that maybe we're going to be going into the worst period here. Um, again, I don't want to read the whole article, but... Um, I want, to, I want to look at this last part here. So one side of behavior like this has a strong history of being contrarian, but that was also the case in May. And here we are at lower lows. Everything is horrible and there is no sustained interest among buyers. Putting it another way, the value of stocks globally has declined by $25 trillion this year. $25 trillion. Remembering that the U.S. stock market is worth about 25. So what did we delete globally? Almost the equivalent value of the entire U.S. stock market, period. More, of those ha more, of the more than half of those losses are also in America. So, right, there's a lot of money being lost. And uh, again, we talked about the 200 weekly moving average. Um, again, the S&P is approaching a crucial 200 week moving average and the Fed put. So from the article we talked about before, um, it noted that 2002 and 2008 were the only periods where when we hit that 0.0, .0 uh, bear and bull uh, market indicator that we actually continued lower because there was a recession. And if we cannot bounce off this 200 weekly moving average, uh, what are we likely repeating? 2000 or 2008. Every other time going back to Black Monday in 1987, we bounced off the 200 weekly, bounced off the 200 weekly in 1990, bounced off the 200 weekly in 2011, bounced off in 2016, bounced off in 2018. And here we are. So what does that mean? I'll show you. So if we look over to here, we're going to jump forward for a second here. Um, again, this is a pattern we've been looking at. So negative, uh, right? Negative 30 is going to be roughly our 2020 high. What we're looking at here is going to be a round number of roughly 350 for next week. That is going to correspond with this black line or the 200 weekly moving average. And a lot of charts are right around this key area. We can look at QQQ. We can look at a lot of stocks and they're right around that 200 weekly moving average. So after we understand the context of what the market is, we're going to circle back and try to understand what the charts are telling us because this 200 weekly moving average is going to be so, so, so crucial. Why? We talked about Jerome Powell speaking this week. And uh, I'm actually going to jump forward to one more thing here because um, this is a repeat of what we saw in 2008 versus where we are here. Um, I think we did this video about uh, three, four weeks ago now. And what's so important is that um, again, we note that we're currently in the falling wedge. So right here, we got our falling wedge, which is going to be identified by the blue line. We can note that we did have our head and shoulders rejection. So we have our shoulder, head, shoulder in 2022. We have roughly that same thing here, shoulder, head, shoulder. So now that we understand where we were, now we're going to look at this period right here where we reject off the 50 weekly. We reject off the 50 weekly and that neckline. What happens? We fall below the 50. And then in 2008, we tested the 200. However, ours is all the way down here. And uh, this is very important because the pattern is repeating, but we're technically still above long-term price action because we're above the 200, 200 weekly here. So what I want to point out next is that we had our dead cat bounce out of the falling wedge. Again, hitting where? 
roughly our relative low and our 200 weekly, and that is where we rejected. So if we're going to be falling into the 2008 move, what are we likely going to see? Well, we're likely, likely going to see that the S&P right now, um, again, is now fallen out of its wedge, hit what? Its first relative low, which is where it found resistance, and then leg down. This is now starting to accelerate. The last part I want to point out is just this green line right here, which is where we actually lost our relative low. And then what? Oh boy, it had a huge, I had another gap down and another huge flush. So are we here? Are we here? I do not know, but this is unprecedented. Again, we have not seen declines like this since the Great Depression. And that's very sobering because I was not alive during that time. So this is history, but I was not alive for it. Um, so the last thing I just want to point out is that um, there is potential for us to what? Have the acceleration really kick off this week. And with Jerome Powell speaking on Wednesday and Thursday, and uh, again, just showing that here again really briefly, Jerome Powell testifies on Wednesday and Thursday, like we heard from Janet Yellen last week. So if he starts to echo a lot of what uh, Janet Yellen had to say, I think we might be in for a lot more downside. So fear is very high. Um, we know we're near capitulation, but we're not quite seeing the end of it yet. All right, so now we understand the big test and where we should be finding that Fed put. If we do not find it there, we are likely repeating 2000 or 2008. Two more things for us to look at here. So now we understand that there's been $2 trillion wiped out just this week. U.S. stocks are poised for some relief. Why? Let's jump down to the bottom here, and uh, I think I have one section highlighted. Um, again, this is from uh, uh, this is from BlackRock, and if you're not sure who BlackRock is, oh boy, are they big. Um, so again, BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world. Um, BlackRock currently has uh, $10 trillion in assets under management. They are in the business of making money, and they manage the most money. So what they say matters. Let's listen and see what they're telling us. We are not buying this dip because it is not a dip. Um, Alex Brazier, deputy head, deputy head at the firm, said in an interview on Bloomberg TV, it's driven by a change in fundamentals in the equity market with a higher rate path, now a rising probability of recession in the U.S. and a very high likelihood of recession in Europe. And as a result, equities don't look cheap to us at the moment. So this is really interesting because we note that, again, we had an emergency rate meeting uh, from the ECB. So they're already starting to see that the system is starting to break. It is starting to crack. What is this? It's the ECB put. So ECB tool to avert debt crisis 2.0 takes shape as markets are on edge. So yields or bonds are getting too high in Europe. And that is what caused that 2011 and 2015 a debt crisis in Europe. I want to talk about one more thing here called the gambler's fallacy. So as we noted before, uh, the market has now been down for 10 out of the 11 last weeks have been red. We're due for relief. Does it mean we're going to get it? Not necessarily. If we understand what a gambler's fallacy is, this might help us as we are getting prepared for this next week of trading. Let's read what this says here. Um, again, a gambler's fallacy is the belief that the probability for an outcome after a series of outcomes is not the same as a probability for a single outcome. Let's give you an example to make sure it makes sense here. The classic example of the gambler's fallacy occurs when someone flips a coin. If the head lands face up, say, four or five times, most people will believe that the coin will land on the tail side next time, occasionally even arguing that the repeated heads coin increases the likelihood of a future tails coin. So again... 10 out of 11 red weeks. What do people think? They think we're due for a bounce. I think we're due for a bounce. Technically, we're due for a bounce. But we've been due for a bounce for weeks. And it's been 10 out of 11 that have been red. This losses are getting devastating, including Bitcoin, which is now losing uh, 20,000 as I'm recording this video. So we were due for a bounce for a long time here. What happened? Oh, boy, it's down 30%. Uh, it's below 19,000 now. It's back below 2018 highs, back below 2020 highs. This is looking devastating. So I think a lot of people who have never been through a full cycle before are falling prey to the gambler's fallacy. So even though we're due for a red week, are we going to get it? Well, again, this here tells us that maybe not. And this was the worst weekly decline of 2008. From the close of the week to the low, we dropped by 25% in a single week. One more time, we fell by 25% in a single week after already having huge declines. 
So now let's uh, tie this all together. When we were talking about the 2008 versus 2022, again, this is roughly a month ago, we were showing that if we, if we maintain our current rate of descent, we are what? On track to repeat 2007 and 2008. So technically, fundamentally, we are due to go down if we do not bounce at that Fed put level or the 200 weekly moving average. We can note here that Bitcoin just destroyed that 200 weekly moving average as well. So we're going to go through and do look at more technicals after, but I just want to make sure people understand how high the stakes are. They're extremely, extremely high. All right, so what the Fed's talk talking this week as well, what are some of the experts saying? Because these people are smarter than me. So what do I do? When in doubt, I defer to them because they know more than me, they're more intelligent, and frankly, they know what is going on. Mohamed El Arian is a very smart man. Um, he, he, again, let's just read what he says here, right? Um, fears the Fed will e end up flip-flopping, which means that they're hiking more today and they're going to be easing more tomorrow. So how can we actually try to understand what they're telling us? Well, if we go back to our reliable Goldman Sachs, here they're telling us their current rate of, rate, uh, their path of rate hikes. So here they're telling us that, um, again, 25 in March, this is already locked in. That's why it's solid blue. So Mar May, March, May, June, all locked in. They're anticipating 75 in July, 50 in September, 25, 25. To get to the end of 2022 at roughly 3.25 to 3.5%. But um, when we look at beyond 2023, a lot of people, a lot of participants, and the futures rate path is currently forecasting rate cuts in 2024, including Ray Dalio. So what does that mean? It means we're at risk of flip-flopping, where they're hiking too much today, and they're going to have to ease tomorrow. It's very, very, very notable to me. All right, so in about uh, 17 minutes, um, that is pretty much at a very high level what has happened to the stock market this week, why the stakes are so high, and why we have to pay particular attention to what we could do next. So I just want to quickly go through and talk about these really fast here. So 10 out, 10 out of 11 red weeks in a row. Again, the gambler's fallacy. Worst week of 2022. First weekly close in a bear market. 2018 and 2020 highs have been lost. So there's a couple of asset classes which have notably lost those highs. Um, here we're going to look first at Bitcoin, which again, this is just the, uh, this was supposed to be the inflation hedge. And um, it's proving that it's not really there. We can note that we're already completing the M and it looks like it wants more downside. How far down? I don't know, but about 10,000 looks like a strong area of support if we cannot bounce back above 20 and reclaim that 200 weekly moving average at about 22,400. So the stakes are very high right now. We're now back below the 2020 high and below the 2018 high. Other asset classes that are already below that include the Russell. So the Russell here again, there's our 2018 high, there's our 2020 high. There is our rejection at the relative low and then a fresh cut to where? New 52 weeks low, lows. Gap has been filled. However, now that we are below the 2018 and 2020 high, these are going to act as very strong resistance, which means that this green line is now actually going to turn into a red line, which means it's going to be hard for us to get back above it. So as other sectors start getting dragged below those 2020 highs, we have to pay particular attention to it. Around the world, we also note that this is already happening. Looking here at the DAX, we note that 2018, 2020, which is which was resistance, turned into support in 2021, and now we're below it once and below it twice. This also looks like an M for what? More downside. So the stage is set. It's very important from here. So if we understand that, as we go through the rest of the charts later in the show, you'll understand exactly what is important here. All right, um, 200 weekly moving averages. So we're gonna come back and look at those after as we briefly previewed. Um, that's really important to me. One more thing I wanna point out here is annual volume because whether you're aware of it or not, um, SPY is actually on track for elevated volume in 2022. So we can, excuse me, um, we can also note, note here that we have a bearish engulfing candle on the annual. This is classic bearish, very hard to argue that. So as we are winding winding down the end of June, again, halfway through the year, let's look and see how much volume there's been on the taper so far. 12.72 billion. So if we go over here, right, there's been 12.72 billion in 2022. So that's where we're at so far year to date. We're going to multiply that by two to try to figure out where we could project to be by the end of the year. 
Now we look at 2021 and let's see how much volume there is. So last year there is 18.57. So 18.57. Now we ask ourselves, okay, we're gonna go to our calculator. We're gonna go 12.72 times two, run track for 25.44 billion, right? That's our projection. So if we're going to, uh, let me just uh, throw one, one more in here, right? Let's go 2022 projection. All right, this is now equal to 25.44. Okay, so 25.44, how much larger is that than 2021? 25.44 divided by 18.57, it's 36% bigger. Why is this important? Well, uh, quantitative tightening only actually officially began on June 15th. We're seeing less liquidity. We're seeing uh, daily repo activities of nearly 2 trillion. And there is some other charts which give us an ominous warning if this starts to really progress. Why? Again, bearish engulfing annual candle. If we get more volume or continue to go up at the current rate, we're gonna have a bearish engulfing candle with volume to confirm it. That's not looking pretty. Look over here at QQQ now. Oh, wow. QQQ is almost actually at last year's volume already. Yep, 11 billion in 2021. We got 9.3 billion in 2022 so far. So if we project where we would be at the end of the year, we would be at roughly 18.5 billion. And uh, that is going to be divided by 11 from last year. So divided by 11, we're actually on pace for 70% more volume on QQQ. And what has it already done? It's already lost its 2022 low as we reviewed earlier this week. All right, one more to look at here, ARC. Oh my goodness. So if we're gonna be going into 2002 or uh, again, 2000 or 2008, um, does this give us a warning here? Yep, uh, it puked up the whole thing. And this is so devastating because in 2020, we had half a billion in volume. And then for uh, 2021, five times more at 2.5 billion roughly. And then this year, 3.5. So the buying is actually so far this year been eclipsed by almost a factor of 10. So why is that important? Well, it's so important because as we go back to our psychology chart here, I said that I think we're at roughly complacency where we just have to cool off for the next big rally. So what I'm personally not sure about is whether we are actually starting to invalidate this pattern or making new history because um, we've actually lost this area right here, which is so important to me. So it's starting to look like we're actually closer to here. And I'll show you what that means here on the chart. But before I do that, um, the reason why I thought we were actually only at complacency was because while equities have slumped, paralysis rather than panic best describes investor positioning. This year said Hartnett, who said that for every $100 into equities in the past year or so, only $3 has been redeemed. And as we noted before, we saw record outflows from hedge funds so far this year, which means that people are finally smashing that sell button. And I believe that is largely due to some margin calls, which are now going to be pushing us even lower. I'll show you the reason why. Uh, if I look here at uh, energy on a weekly basis, um, right? It's actually, uh, let me actually have a look here. So um, let, me see, let me just make sure I have my thoughts together here. So, so if we look at XLE, it's been down every single day this week, right? And including th Thursday and Friday of last week. So we note that it's been down for uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sessions, sessions in a row. What's not happened though? Well, oil was not down for every single session. It actually started to flatline, got the dip bot, it went lower. So I think that there might be some margin calls that are actually happening here. Uh, why? Well, again, there's only been three cents on the dollar that's been redeemed. And if we are only at the area of complacency, again, ask yourself what people have been saying. We just have to cool off for the next big rally. There finally is an exodus where they are running for the doors, trying to get out. So now let's look at our uh, SPY chart to see whether or not we are repeating or if we are not. Um, SPY, one month, throw the lines back in. So are we diverging or breaking the pattern here? Um, yes. So... Let me see if I can actually do this here where we can compare it side by side. Let me pull this over to here. Let me snap this here to the, I can't do that. All right, let me actually just do this then. I'll snap the screenshot from here. We'll go back to here, we'll do that. And then we'll bring this one up over here. I'll we'll snap that one to the, snap this one over here to the right. So what I just wanna point out is uh, whether or not we are seeing more evidence that we are either fulfilling the pattern or we are not. And uh, as of right now, again, we note that We've already fallen below the pink line. So we fell below once. We're supposed to be snapping back. 
If we cannot close back above the pink line here at about 400, um, that looks very, very bad. We're not even going to get our dead cat bounce, and we're not even completing the normal psychology pattern. We're just going to be going down for a new fresh low. And that 2008 uh, versus 2022 pattern is very ominous to me, where if we do start that decline, oh man, it could get nasty fast. And with Jerome Powell speaking on Wednesday, Thursday, I am not going to be trying to pretend like this is going to be an easy week to trade. It's going to be very difficult. We also have to note that we're getting quite close to the end of the month now. So this is a monthly candle. We're looking for a monthly chart to repeat. And if it can't do it, man, what is going to happen from here? We're making history again. Again, the declines have not been seen since the Great Depression. So if we're in an unprecedented territory, um, is there anything that we can, we can look to to try to understand what's going to happen? We talked about this, right? So um, complacency for me means that not a lot of people are actually redeeming or cashing in. And right here, that would mean we just have to cool off for the next big rally. Why would I want to sell when uh, we're not really seeing any of that happen? And I know I closed one of the articles in terms of the uh, the margin calls, but we've seen retail go through the margin calls. We saw that high search on YouTube, sorry, on Google search. And uh, again, I don't have the article up anymore. I closed it out, but they believe that there is some margin calls happening because commodities actually closed the week higher, but some of the underlying stocks actually closed down, which looks like forced selling. So that would, that would signal that we're actually here in anxiety where, why am I getting margin calls? The dip is taking longer than expected, right? Okay, so now we understand the context. Now, again, we understand who's been buying and selling. Well, Goldman's making the market. They're making the market on both sides. They, uh, right, they, they gave themselves a new price target to go lower, and now they're there to sell to clients. So clients are boosting their short sales aggressively, and they're right there to sell it to them. Leverage is also near five-year lows, which means that people are not looking to take on risk. Who's looking to buy? Well, it's corporate America with share buybacks. And who's the market maker? Goldman Sachs. So they have a secret weapon because they're doing the buying. They're doing the selling. They see all the order flow. And they've give us, given us a revised target of 3150 for the S&P by the end of the year. Where's 315? Oh, man, that's like a lot lower than we are now. Yep. Um, that's all the way down here, 315. Right, that's that's a lot lower from where we are right now. That's an additional additional thirteen percent. It's almost a repeat of this week. And again, two thousand eight showed us that. Yeah, well, um, if we're gonna really start repeating the cycle here, um, it could get a lot worse. One more thing I actually want to point out is gonna be us looking at this right here. And um, I just want to point out that once the selling starts to accelerate, um, it becomes easier for us to go lower than it is to to, to sustain. So right here, again, once we lose that area, about right here, ish, right, the, the the green line, what happens? Well, it starts to really get nasty. It starts to really accelerate. And we look here, we got progressively lower lows, which we pointed out in the last video. We got one, two, three, and then we start the reversal, where we actually push off the lows and start going back into a new bull market, ultimately making new highs. So if we keep that in mind, and now we look at these progressive lows, what do we have here? One, two, three. So that tells me that if we're going to start repeating, yeah, absolutely, this could happen. And then we look at where we are right now in 2022. Well, uh, do we have progressively lower lows here? No, but the pattern is already starting to repeat and we have to be mindful of it. So again, looking back to here, that would mean that ultimately we could actually go all the way down to our 50 month, sorry, 200 monthly moving average, maybe down to 200. Uh, that's pretty scary for me. I don't want to focus on that right now because uh, that might be out of the question for us, but we cannot discount the potential. So with that in mind, now we know the levels for the week. The levels for this week are going to be uh, very important. So we note that we're right now at center field. Support is going to be found at 365, which is our 2021 low. After we looked at the yearly chart, we know where that comes from now. 362 is going to be our current low of this year for 2022. 350 is going to be our 50... It's 349.5. It's probably going to revise to 350 for next week. So I put 350, nice round number. That is our 200 weekly moving average for next week. Um, on the upside, we got 370, which is a round number and roughly our daily gap. Then we got 375, right? Roughly 375, which is a nice round number. It's also roughly our 2020 close and our 2021 open. 373.88 is the close of 2021, sorry, 2020. And then 374.5, I believe, is the open for 2021. I'm just rounding it up to 375 so that we understand that if we are over uh, 375, we're back above the 2020 close, 
back over the 2021 high, and that is important. Finally, we got 379 as our 2021 high. So we went through this uh, earlier, but I'll just show you exactly what this means because um, I think it's important for people to understand the context. So when we're looking here, um, we, we, look, we looked at QQQ before. Let's actually delete this stuff now because it's a little bit scary. So if we're going to actually reverse back up higher, what we need to do is actually, again, this is a yearly chart. It's very zoomed out. So it's very easy to see the levels. If we cannot get back above the low and the open of last year or reclaim the high of 2021, uh, sorry, 2020, these are going to be resistance where we're likely going to what? Start rejecting off it and go lower. So again, right now we have a bearish engulfing candle. The way to invalidate the pattern is to reclaim some of the key areas. That is going to be found notably right here at about 375. So if now we look at the numbers here again, the open for uh, 2021 is 375.31. The highest number is going to be the 2021 high at 378.5. So again, getting back above resistance three or 379 means that we're reclaiming the 2021 lows and open and we're back above the 2020 highs, which means that potentially we could get, get, we could get closer to that 384, which is going to be where our bear market officially was confirmed, where we're 20% where we're off the highs. So again, one more time, just to show where that 384 comes from, going back to here, we can look at SPY, look at a weekly chart. And we note that um, off the all-time high, uh, going down by roughly 20, we get here at uh, 384. That's how we get to negative 20% off the highs. All right, there we go. Bear market targets. Well, we fit a lot of them. Um, these are the targets that I laid out in, I believe, uh, December or January, and a lot of them have hit now. Uh, 360 seem like, uh, why not, right? 364 is not that far from where we are now. I should have actually crossed that one out. We've already hit it. We, we penetrated that. So what's next? 340s and 330s, which is where we're what? Expecting to find that Fed put. So if we cannot bounce off of this lower part here, uh, or the 330s, that is where we start repeating 2008 or 2000, where we were, where we went down by how much? 50%. So let's go back in time and see what happened in, uh, right, let's go to a monthly chart. Let's go back here. So let's go back in time to 2008 uh, from peak to trough. So again, this is what they call the lost decade, where we went nowhere from 2000 to 2013, right? Uh, got your money back, lost it twice, right? So you lost your money, lost half your money once, got your money back, lost half your money twice, got your money back, and then it finally went higher. So in 2000, from peak to trough, we went down by 50. In 2008, from peak to trough, we went down by 55-ish. So if we cannot bounce off that 200 weekly moving average, which I'm trying to point out right here, what are we likely going to do? Well, everything tells us that we're going to be going down by 50%. That's right, 5-0, not 1-5. So from roughly 480, what does that mean? Yeah, uh, we're heading down to roughly uh, 220. And why is that so important? Well, um, that 220 would be where we're going to roughly find our next major monthly moving or next major average. So again, we're looking to see if we can bounce off of the 200 weekly, which right now is at about 349. If we can't save that, where would be the next natural spot? Well, we look here at the 50, sorry, we look at the monthly chart. So where does the 50 monthly roughly line with? Ah, it's also roughly right here. The 200 weekly moving average and the 50 monthly moving average are in the 340s. So if we can't save 340s, and we lose it, where are we likely going to go? We're likely going to go to the black line on the monthly, which is what? 207 as of right now, but it will curl up over time, which means that if we meet it, uh, say like sometime in 2023 or 2024, this black line is going to curl up, and that is where we could ultimately find our bottom. Um, right? We don't have enough data on the chart here to actually see that. Let's look at SPX, though. SPX, ah, interesting. So when in 2000 and 2008, when we lose the blue line, which is our 50, 50 average, we go where? To almost the black line. Ah, in 2002 and in 2008. I hope you are understanding what I am laying out here. If you are, I would appreciate a thumbs up, dropping me a comment, and please subscribe to the channel if you've not already. We put out videos every single day except for Sunday. Also important to understand that um, right now, the S&P is currently off by about 20 off the high. QQQ is about 30% off the high. But if we're ultimately going to be going down to that, uh, right, maybe up to 50% over the next couple of years, 
Is it really so bad to raise some cash now? I don't think so. If you're down by 20%, you have to make 25% to recoup your losses or to break even. But if you trim some now, and again, I'm not a financial advisor, I can't tell you when to buy and sell, but um, let's look at history. So if history tells us that if we lose that 200 weekly moving average, and we're gonna ultimately go down by 50, and you've lost about 25%, you can make your money back by buying the right dip. Again, let's pretend we go down by 50% and you've lost, uh, you've lost uh, right, 25%. Well, if we go down by 50, it should double for people to get their money back. And let's look at that as an example here. So, um, right, if you bought right here in 2000 and then uh, you held on all the way through, you lost half your money once, you got your money back. That's why we form a double top. And then you lost half your money again. And then you have to wait all the way until 2013 to what? To break even, which is what it's pointing at, uh, telling us here. Gains required to break even. You lose half your money, stocks have to double for you to recoup. However, there's also this period here where we have inflation. So you get your money back, but your buying power is not the same, which means that you're actually getting hurt. And here on the monthly, once we stop going up, we start going sideways and we start going down. That is our warning sign. Where we start going down is maybe about right here. If you would have sold, let's actually zoom in a little bit more and make sure people understand what I'm trying to point out. So let's look at 2000 versus 2008 here. So once we stop going up, which means the candle stops pointing up, we start pointing down. Let's pretend you sold right here. You saved yourself how much losses, right? You did lose. Off the high, it's off by about 11, but you ultimately saved yourself, um, right? 80% uh, of the declines. So you sell here, you buy back when we what? Stop going down, start going back up. Let's pretend it's about right here. The average person only got their money back, right? They buy in 2000, they get their money back in 2008. You lose 10%, but then you buy back here. And when the people who held on get their money back, you're nearly doubling up which means you're recouping your losses and then making more. And then you had a chance to do it again. Why? We note that there was another opportunity where we dropped by 50% in 2008. So now if we look at this, again, when we stop going up, uh, call it about probably right here, what do we start doing? We start going sideways and we start going down. And at the bottom, when we stop going down and we start going back up, there is an opportunity to buy back in one more time. So again, I'm not a financial advisor, but if you think that we're gonna be going lower and this decision's yours, you have to ask yourself, do I just wanna ride or die? Or am I going to potentially try to recoup some of my losses? It's really important to keep that in mind. In terms of key dates that could drive this week, again, Monday's gonna be a holiday. Happy Juneteenth to all Americans. Uh, we got Fed speakers this week. We got uh, Mester, Barkin, Evans on Tuesday and Wednesday. We got Harker on Wednesday, we got Fed Daly on Friday, and we got Jerome Powell for a testimony, uh, try testifying on Wednesday and Thursday. This is gonna be very important. I'm also gonna be focusing on uh, consumer confidence coming out on Friday and jobless claims coming out on Thursday. Why bullish or bearish? Uh, there's been a lot of valley compression. It doesn't look like it was enough though. Uh, bears, again, bears are in full control. 454, Impenetrable Fortress, DXY, TNX breakouts confirmed, recession risk is now center stage in the new cycle, tech leading to the decline, check. Uh, surprises was this week, could be Powell. Also hearing from Biden that he might be receptive to actually lifting some of those Chinese tariffs, which would actually be a boon for the market, and maybe provide a little bit of uh, relief. All right, so for the bulls, uh, we talked about uh, the bull breakout and back test before. It failed. Uh, we did not hold the back test. It failed. So as of right now, the bulls do not have very much in the tank in terms of uh, catalysts. IWM and ARC bounces. Let's just go through those really fast to make sure we understand what actually happened because there's a lot of data in there. Um, so let's go to IWM. So all we were able to do was bounce off the 2020 highs, get a massive dead camp bounce, and then perfectly reject off of our relative low and our downtrend. And then what? Nasty decline to a lower low. So this is showing us that uh, the market did not just dead, uh, did not reverse. It was a dead camp bounce at the first area where, where we would expect to find sellers. Sellers were found and we plunged. Now looking at ARC, Almost the same thing happened, but ARC was, sorry, ARC was only able to make it to its first low. I thought it was gonna make it to 52. So that tells me that we're even more bearish than I originally thought. And we're hovering right around the lows again here, down by 70, 80% off the highs. ARC has been pummeled or decimated. So the bulls have less ammo. 
In terms of the bears, again, we talked about the bear market targets. We've talked about the Fed rhetoric, which we're going to hear more of this week. And the balance sheet its not even officially started running off yet. I think it only officially began on the 15th. Please drop me a comment and correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it was on the 15th. So this is important because the market's getting ahead of it. And uh, in periods when the Fed balance sheet actually starts reducing, like in, uh, like in 20, uh, 2017, 2018, what happens? Well, the market tanks. So if we already have all these headwinds and the market's going to be hiking into a recessionary environment, then it's going to be a Fed-induced recession. Again, this is from... Uh, <clears throat> From May, this is from a month ago too. Recession-like behavior. Home Depot stocks relative to Walmart shares mirrors previous downturns. We talked about this as well. And then finally, uh, right, we have that, uh, uh, we have the lost decades from, again, this is from our bear market of uh, 2022 original uh, thesis. And what I just want to point out here is that history is repeating itself, whether or not you are aware of it. And if we ignore this, we're likely going to get hurt. All right, so at about uh, 40 minutes, I think I'm through the large chunk of what I wanted to do. One more thing to look at here is going to be options, and then we're going to uh, jump forward and have a look at a whole bunch of charts. So uh, we understand that OPEX is now over $3.2 trillion in national value expired this week. Uh, huge moves, huge swings, and uh, now we're going to try to make sense of post-expiry where people are getting positioned. Why? VIX is over 30. Options are very expensive. So if they're buying options right now, it's very notable. So we have uh, three out of four days next week, which are, which are going to be OPEX because Monday is a holiday. As we look forward to June 21st or Tuesday, we're looking at the 16s or eight strikes above and below. First thing that sticks out to me is going to be the volume at 370 because it's the only one with over 100,000. 360 is pretty close at 90,000 and the, uh, the premium is roughly on par, right? Just over a dollar, roughly a dollar fifty. Second thing I would note is that we have uh, open interest and volume starting at about 367. These are worth about $3. So 367 plus $3 equals 370. This kind of looks like a spread, but there's only really open interest here at about 367. On the put side, where is there open interest? Well, um, open interest starts at 370. Why? Well, because it's probably all the way up higher. Um, Monday is not, or sorry, Tuesday is not Monday, which is really Tuesday. It's not really a uh, busy one as well. But when I'm looking here, I note that we have a 365 and 360 put spread. And these 365s are worth about $3, uh, $3 which means break even is at about 362.50 to 362. So that's uh, that's for Tuesday. All right. So bulls maybe have a little bit of uh, relief they're looking for, but it's pretty equally matched. And that put spread is actually more money. There's more money tied up in that put spread. So if it converts to open interest going into the open on Tuesday, I'll be paying attention to that. Looking forward to Wednesday, which is going to be the next day. Where are the patterns? Ah, 365 and 360. What is that? Put continuation. We can also note a whole bunch of zeros here, which means that they're probably just expanding the chain because uh, they're probably just doing every $2. Now they're going every buck. Um, so they've expanded the chain. Same thing over here, right? 59, 61, 63, 65, or 67. They're adding in all the strikes. And over here, what is there? Well, it's muted. So there's 370 here and... If I was to guess, it's probably because they're buying a 370, 370, 370, 375 call spread. I don't really care about that because what we care about is going to be the 16s or what is most likely going to pay out, meaning what is probable. It's possible we go up to 375, but it is more probable we're going to remain within this range because that is what's most likely going to happen. All right, as we look forward to Friday, um, let's see if there's any more clues here because so far it looks like the bulls are bullish for Monday, but there's very little follow through in terms of dollars and open interest through to Wednesday. Looking to Friday, ah, right, continuation again, 360 and 365. Looking over to the call side, what do we have? Well, we got that 370 again with some volume here at 368. So the bears definitely have the motivation and the advantage because there's more of it here. Um, why is this important? Well, let's go back to our bear market targets of 2022 and ask ourselves whether 360 is important. So again, they are bearish uh, from June 21st to June 24th or into the close on Friday for 360. Oh man, 364 is our 2021 low, which means they think we're going to be what? Below the 2021 low. Oh no. And then we're only about 10 points off actually hitting that 200 weekly moving average right here. Again, the black line corresponds with the black number, 349.55. It will curl up slightly next week, so probably closer to 350. So, okay, um, that's interesting. Um, now let's have a look forward to 
uh, the July monthly chain. And I'm gonna look at the 16s, but I'm also gonna look at the uh, beyond because this is gonna be one month out. And uh, we wanna see whether or not people are already positioning around that 350 area, which we already know is very important. And again, with VIX over 30, buying a long dated options are gonna be very, very expensive. So what, what's the first thing I notice? Well, there's no volume over 10K. There's also no open interest over 10K. So the bear, the bulls are like, man, screw it. It's not even worth buying anything. On the bear side, what do we got? 375. We got 365. Sorry, 370 here is gushing, right? That's a big one. 100,000 here. Um, then we also have uh, 365, 362, and 355. Um, the large ones here are going to be... Um, right? 370 and 375. There's probably a whole bunch more higher as well that they bought going into here because I was tracking it. But what's important is just that there is bearish continuation all the way through to here. So if now we ask ourselves, and uh, let's actually look here because there's also uh, volume. So if we look here, um, we can actually move this line here to show that it looks like they're building a, a spread as well. Again, probably going lower. Um, I'll look at that in a moment. But um, these 370s have about uh, $13 in premium, which means we have to be at where? at 357 for them to get their money back. And these 357s are, are worth about $7, which means they get their money back at 350, which means, yeah, that's how we get to that uh, 200 weekly moving average test. All right, so now if we look beyond the, uh, and again, this right here is really big, right? That's really big. Um, if we now look beyond the 16s to look and see if there's actually anything down at 350, um, it'll be very, very, uh, in oh, wow, okay. Oof, um, I did not look at this ahead of time. So um, again, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm going through this with you live too. So you can see my reaction, right? Woof, uh, yeesh. Oops, um, looks like I cut it off at the uh, wrong area here. So let me resnap the screenshot um, and I'll show you what I see here because this is not looking positive at all if you're bullish. If you're bearish, you're like, hell yeah, let's go. Um, right, even bigger volume here and more open interest. So for me, it looks like they're building a 370 to 350 uh, put spread. And that is the biggest open interest I can see here. I can even scroll further down and see that. Um, th that's, the, that's the biggest fat stack. So there's nothing over 100,000 that gets below uh, 350. There is 75,000 at 340 though. So what this means to me is that this is kind of where people think we're gonna max out. And if now we think about the, the strike and we look at the premium, we can get a number on where they get their money back here. And again, it's notable that this looks like it puts spread. So for me, what this means is that by July 15, they don't want us to be below 350. They want us to close at 350. That's why it's a put spread. So that 350 area is already really important on the, on the weekly chart. And now when we look at the premium, um, we look at 350. Um, plus six dollars ish. There's a dollar that was lost overnight. Let's call it roughly six, which means they get their money back at 344. Okay, so 340s, 344. Is that number important? Ah oh, man, it's the 50 monthly moving average. Yep. So 200 weekly um, is actually a 349. Let me actually get the correct slide here because I think that I forgot to duplicate it for the one that's higher up. So here we got 349 and 344 for the 50 monthly moving average. And again, is that close or exact? Man, it's exact, Justin. I don't like hearing that though. 350 minus six is equal to 344. Yeah, uh, there you go, right? So if you, if, you, if you trade options, please make sure you understand what I'm presenting here. I know this might be very confusing for people as well, but what I'm trying to show you is that um, we have a technical reason why we could go down to 350. We now have confirmation that people are already looking at that and they're tying up millions, if not billions of dollars into that. All right, so I thought I could get I could get this video out a little bit shorter, but there's just so much for us to go through on a, uh, on a weekly perspective that um, I'm making the video as long as I have to. So at about 50 minutes now, we're gonna shift gears and start looking at charts. So, uh, First thing I want to point out, like I mentioned before, is just that we want to be looking at a couple of things here. So we want to be looking at um, the S&P has now been down for 10 out of 11 weeks, uh, 10 out of the last 11 weeks. It is the worst weekly decline of 2022. And then we want to look at 2018 and 2020 highs as we are also looking at the 200 weekly moving average. So let's keep a fresh perspective as we now look at the charts, as we think about, again, 200 weekly moving average, and then all of these bearish notes here because if some charts are looking better or worse than the S&P, that is gonna tell us whether or not there are new leaders 
or new laggards emerging out of the market. And before I forget, I want to look at the heat map because I think this might actually be quite insightful for us. So let's go over here to the heat map and then we'll have a look at the, uh, the charts in a moment here. All right, so going here, let's actually hide this. Let's go to a week to date and uh, whoa, right? Whoa, um, negative five to negative 10 looks like the norm for everything. Indiscriminate selling across the board. If we gr group it by sector, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of relief here. Couple, couple of boxes are green, but man, it's not even really worth talking about. Boeing up five, right? That's notable. Um, VRTX, let's just ignore that. So weekly, again, it's devastating. If, you, if, you've, if you've been living under a rock, you didn't know it was devastating. I think most people do. Now let's look at year-to-date performance. The reason why I want to look at year-to-date performance is because we, again, we were inside a bear market territory for all but, uh, all but Apple. And now Apple has also joined the club, meaning bear market territory. So if we look at that and we think about are the biggest blocks, um, let's actually go to uh, no group. So let's go to no groups. So we can actually look at the biggest influence influencers on the S&P 500 and see whether or not they are, let me just get rid of that line there. Get in kind of their NC. Man, why is it doing that? Um, anyways, let's just go like this, here we go. So are we in bear market territory? Apple, yes. Why? Again, this is a weekly close, so it's really important. The Friday close is the most important price of the week. Microsoft, negative 27. Google, 26. Amazon, 37. Tesla, 40. Berkshire, not quite there. Meta, 52. So these ones here are notable, but um, they're not big enough to offset all the other big blocks. So we're definitely in a bear market for not just the market, for the indices, but also for individual stocks. Um, one thing I want to point out uh, before we look at all the individual charts is just going to be how we see some charts actually already reacting to the uh, 200 weekly moving average. So I want to look at a trillion dollar company first. I want to look at the ones that have already lost it. So that's going to be Amazon. And looking at Amazon here, again, when we started to lose our range or our uh, right, uh, our sideways action, what happened? Well, we plunged right to where? Right to the 200, uh, 200 weekly. We bounce up slightly and then we reject off of it. And then what? Form a fresh low. So this is what could happen to the other trillion dollar companies as they start to go out of their sideways box and then look to potentially dive down to here. For Apple, that's $100. So that's really important. We look at Meta as well. Is there a template here? Yes, sir. So we lose our box going sideways, and where do we go? Well, in a single candle, we go from the 50 weekly all the way to the 200 weekly. So Meta and Amazon are already below the 200 weekly, but once they started dropping, it was a nasty, sharp drop for Meta. That is a decline of 30% in a single week. Remember Netflix? Oh man, it did the same thing. Yep, um, starts losing its range. Again, not a trillion dollar company anymore. Not, it's still part of the Fang MG, but look, right? Starts declining. One, tries to save the 50, and then just slices right down to the 200. And then what? Another fresh leg down. This is looking terrible. Another chart we can look at is gonna be, um, what's the other one I want to look at here? I think that probably gives us a good clue. Uh, let's, let's, look, let's look at Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, right? Um, only just finally making it here. Why? Well, because the price got way above the averages. What is this? It's called exuberance. So lots of exuberance, massive M, and now it is not even pausing on the 200. It stomped it. So we probably paused at about 22.5 uh, on the daily chart. Yep. So again, we paused on the daily chart, but um, the other trillion other companies were able to actually withhold um, with, withstand that area for up to a week, which is the weekly chart. On Bitcoin, it paused there on the daily and just stomped with big fat volume here. Ethereum, not far behind, actually even worse. Why? Increasing red volume as we dive down below 1,000 and way below 1,200, which is our 200 weekly. What happened at 1,200? Yeah, we tempted to pause here on the daily chart. Got a big and massive volume, right? But it ultimately flushed. So, with that in mind, now let's look at uh, top down. So we're gonna go from SPY, QQQ. We're gonna go all the way down and have these uh, grouped off here. And thank you for watching all the way through to the end of the video if you're still here, because uh, I put a lot of effort into these videos. And I think that if you're still watching now, you're likely gonna at least uh, have a sobering thought in terms of where the market could go. And hopefully you are more prepared. So S&P, um, losing its falling wedge, uh, dead cap bounce, rejected on the low. So this is looking pretty bare, right? We already rejected off our key low here. 
and uh, that's bearish. So the 200, 200 weekly is really where I'm looking for support at 350. Let's see if it can hold. Um, QQQ, uh, again, right around that 200 weekly as well, which ironically is where our falling wedge lands. So it's currently pointing right at that uh, 50 week, 200 weekly at 263 or roughly $10 lower. We also only really have a doji here on QQQ. So uh, it held a lot of its range better than other stocks because it's already negative 30 off the high. So right now we are negative 34 on a closing basis and the pink line is gonna represent negative 30. So um, QQQ is actually about 50% lower than SPY. SPY is about negative 20. QQQ is at about negative 30. The dollar is uh, closing up again. Uh, Made a new high, new 52-week high. Uh, it's looking bullish. Um, hard to deny. It's got a golden cross. It's got a W. It wants to win. Um, now looking at the VIX. Uh, VIX is actually closing it with a doji, but up 12% of the week. That cup and handle looks uh, looks prominent to me. And uh, we're now entering an area of elevated volatility, which is going to be above 30. We have to pay attention to that. Over 30 means risk is higher. <laughs> Two-year note, absolutely crushed it. Uh, from early 2020, it is up by more than 1,000%. Broke through the 2018 high, as a lot of other areas are actually breaking below, so that is a massive bull break. Looking at the 10-year note, very similar, but where did it pause? It paused right here on that 2019 high. So it's not sure it wants to go higher. It has a uh, shooting star, um, but it's closing green. Um, we're going to skip these ones here because it's the futures. We're going to skip the Russell because we looked at IWM. The DAX. Again, the DAX is now below. The, sorry, this is the FDAX. So this is the futures DAX. I'm just looking at the 2018 high, 2020 high, which is now turning into resistance, not support. So again, that's the telltale sign that um, if we're going to be going into a fresh leg lower, we have to pay attention to it. Also, I have to look here at the uh, 200 weekly moving average, which is what? Lost. For what? A second time. We had a chance to bounce off at once. And now we're right back below here. Yuck. Oil, um, pretty dramatic move lower. Um, this is down on the fears of recession because recession means there's going to be less economic activity, which is going to lead to less demand. So there we go. There's also more demand coming on from China, though. So I don't know if this is just related to options or if there's actually uh, more upside or downside from here. Volume is muted. Um, gold, um, even though it's closing down, it's closing right above the 50 weekly moving average, which means that even though gold is getting a little bit of a tick down, people are still preferring to hold on to gold than a lot of other assets. Why? It's above its short-term price or the 50 weekly moving average. BTC, absolutely stomped. Uh, this is devastating. So I'm sorry for anyone who is getting hurt in these markets. I've been here. I've survived. So if you're still watching, I um, encourage you to go to our community tab where I am offering free help. Um, moving And again, just looking here at those 2018 highs, as, as we noted before, as we lose the 2018 and 2020 highs, volume is ramping up, which means everyone's red. And we're actually lower than we were before all of this global, uh, this global thing happened. I don't want to say the bad word. You know what it means. So Bitcoin right now is actually less bullish than it was um, going all the way back to 2018. So that is way before we had this global lockdown. Ethereum, same thing. It's already stomped its 2018 high. It's now going back to um, its neckline here from the uh, 2018 head and shoulders. So that's right here at about uh, 900. And it's dropping fast. It's down by a third this week. Also have elevated volume. Um, we also note that every wick um, since we started the big plunge below uh, 2000 has been upper. So Upper wick here, and then that's a red dildo because we don't have any wicks. Opens and just sells off and currently at the low with increasing volume. Very bearish. Apple, um, losing its falling wedge, uh, losing its supply pocket. What's next? Uh, well, the next true support is going to be at about 100. There are relative lows to, uh, to, to test first at about 120, uh, 115, but ultimately probably going to land at about 100. Let's see if Warren Buffett cracks open that wallet and buys Apple because last time he said it did not dip enough for him to buy more. Uh, Microsoft, uh, still channeling lower, evident here by the blue lines. Um, what's a little bit obvious to me, though, is that there's actually increased green volume. So that's notable. And we can note that it's not been nonstop red. Um, it actually managed to close higher than it opened this week. That's why it's green, even though it's a down week. Um, so I'm not sure, but Microsoft looks a little bit better than some of these other ones. Google, same thing, closed higher than it opened. Why? Well, those buybacks we talked about before. Microsoft has buybacks, Google has buybacks. Maybe that's the reason why. We're defending this green line, but it's looking less and less likely like it's going to hold. 
Amazon, talked about it before, it's losing major support. Already below 2020 highs, and now it is currently testing the 2018 highs. I should probably snap a line there so I don't forget. So uh, again, uh, 2018 highs are currently support. If we lose it, it's gonna turn into resistance. Uh, Tesla, um, Tesla is likely going to be one of the stocks that's gonna influence the market for better or for worse. And I have to say that even though it's down by 666 on the week, that number is very interesting. Um, there was a deluge of negative uh, articles regarding Elon, regarding SpaceX, Twitter, Tesla, blah, blah, blah. You even got sued for $250 billion for a Ponzi scheme on Dogecoin. Um, chart doesn't look all that terrible to me. Um, it's actually withholding a lot better than other ones. Uh, Meta, already way down in the dumps, has not stopped it from a fresh cut. There's a gap on the chart, fresh 52-week lows, almost all the way back to the, uh, right to the, uh, um, to the lockdown lows at about 138. Really notable. NVIDIA, um, 2020 highs are actually not quite tested here, but they're close. If we lose that, 2018 highs are about $100 lower. Um, the 200 weekly as well is really close here at about 120. So again, we're still above it. Um, sk skipping through these put call ratios, um, Dow, where? Right on that 200 weekly. Really important, about $5 lower, and we're currently in a buy zone. This is where we would expect to find buyers. Volume's not all that high either. Uh, XLK, um, again, XLK is gonna be the spider managed ETF. Uh, QQQ is managed by Invesco. So this one here pretty much shows us that we lost our range. We bounced off the green line or the relative high. So try to find support here, bounced off, rejected on the relative low, um, and then uh, just back below, right? Gap is filled. Technically, it means it's more able to slide. Also has about uh, 111 here as that uh, 200 weekly. IWM, uh, below the 200 uh, weekly, right? The black line right here is at about 176. Um, it is currently below it. We are currently below the 2018 and 2020 highs. And uh, small cap companies are generally gonna have a harder time uh, competing in an inflationary environment because they compete on price. ARC, devastated, way below the fifth 200 weekly here. But what did it do? It actually pit stopped on the 200 weekly, bounced, found some liquidity, and then rejected to go lower. So that's the kiss of death. Um, NYA, right on that 200 weekly. Again, this is the New York Stock Exchange, includes a composite of 2,000 stocks and uh, decisive move lower. Um, if it can't find support here, it's gonna turn into resistance. Where are we as well? Right on that 2020 high and the 2020 high is not far off. Let's actually snap, snap proper lines so we can uh, identify them. 12, 12, uh, 14,200, 13,600-ish. We can't hold here. It looks like it's gonna it's gonna crash down to 13.6. RSP, not far off of 122 or about $9, also corresponds with our 2020 high. So again, 2020 high, uh, roughly 2018 high is at about 108, and that 200 weekly is right there at about 122. XLF, where is it? Well, it's losing the 2020 high, 2019 high, sorry, and uh, 2021 high, it's right around that 200 weekly as well. Are you noticing a pattern yet? That 200 weekly is super, super, super important. Um, XLV, way off the 50 week, 200 weekly here. And it's also started to break down. It's uh, still a way above its 2020 highs though. Um, that's at about 105 here, and our 200 weekly is at about 108. XLE, decisive move lower, right? Big old crack, um, still technically higher versus the other WICs. Um, I don't know. Um, if we're going to have a big decline, it's probably going to continue next week. Um, I think it's actually going to reverse back up higher. We have a golden cross, and I think it's going to want to go back up just because of the supply and demand uh, constraints. Uh, looking here to XLU or utilities, negative uh, 9% on utilities is devastating because this looks like indis indiscriminate selling. People usually sell tech and then go buy utilities, and we're not seeing that here. It dove way below its 2020 high. And what is it currently testing? 2019 highs. So it's testing 2019 highs. It has, that's a nasty candle, right? That's a huge drop. That size of that candle is dramatic. It looks like the 2020 drop. And then EEM, uh, dumpster fire, right? Emerging markets, not all that much better. So this has been an, uh, probably the longest video I've done in a couple of weeks here. If you've enjoyed the video, I would really appreciate it. Thumbs up if you could drop me a comment. I read every one. Maybe if I don't even reply to everyone, we do read them. And if you've not already, please subscribe to the channel. We put out videos every single day. And if not, I will put my original bear market thesis of 2022 as the video that'll queue up here in a moment. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching. And I wish you all the best of luck this week.